The first episode of this series talked about the meaning of life, at least as biologists define it. But as we move through each of our ancestral clades, it's important that we show their evolution over geologic time so that you can better understand and appreciate our ancestry. The second episode talked about the origin of life soon after the crust of the earth cooled. Then we showed the distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. That segment covered the next couple billion years. Episode 3 ran through the next half dozen clades to evolve over the next billion years or so, up to the emergence of animals at the dawn of the Ediacaran period. Last episode, we talked about the first divisions among true animals, and that took place between 635 and 600 million years ago. This episode covers the emergence of bilaterally symmetrical animals over the next 20 million years or so after that. So why are these things suddenly evolving so fast? Well, first of all, sexual reproducers evolve a lot faster than asexual reproducers because of the haploid combination. That's the advantage of sex. It's like shifting evolution into high gear. Also, these changes are concordant with the development of a predator-prey situation, which evokes natural selection, and that accelerates evolution, too. But even without all that, just with genetic drift, multicellular organisms still evolve faster than single-celled microbes. That's because DNA controls the organization of the cells at two levels. At the most direct level, it controls the structure of the cell itself. In this capacity, the genetic code has already been fine-tuned for a few billion years longer than any multicellular organisms have even existed. Because of this, the systems and mechanisms within the cell have been refined to extreme efficiency, and the genetic replication of the cell itself is almost perfect. However, the second level of replication is not in the construct of the cell, but in the assembly of numerous cells of complex and wildly variable multicellular configurations. The genetic code is significantly more prone to error in this expanded arena, especially since so many different arrangements will work and many different body plans could result from a flurry of random configurations. This also means that the surface appearance of any organism may be dramatically different from its kin, but the foundational structures and mechanisms shared with them are much more difficult to change even over a substantially longer period of time. So there have been relatively few really significant macroevolutionary events since the dawn of life on this planet, and this is one of them. As this article says, the three greatest innovations in biodiversity are the evolution of the eukaryote condition, which was episode two, the emergence of metazoa, which we covered in episodes three and four, and the evolution of a third germ layer, triploblasty, and perhaps simultaneously, bilateral symmetry, which is what we're talking about in this episode. Excluding proto-animals, most true animals have some degree of symmetry at one stage or another. Radiata refers to radially symmetrical animals that can be divided in any direction and produce mirror images, with the mouth being the center of the organism. Comb jellies are the only radial animals that have an anterior-posterior polarity like we do. Having a mouth at one end and an anus at the other means that we can't stay rooted to the ground like anemones or corals. We're better off on the move. Otherwise, bilaterally symmetrical animals are fundamentally different, having a distinct left and right and top to bottom, front to back, a combination of axes that other animals just don't have. And that's much more significant than it sounds, because bilaterians share a chromosomal array of homeobox genes. And some cnidarians have a few hox genes, but bilateral animals have a significantly better arrangement of more of them, leading to a very different bow plan from radiata, one with a central nervous system and a complete digestive tract with a separate mouth and anus, because in some animals, the mouth and the anus are the same orifice. Geneticists experimenting with fruit flies discovered that tampering with hox genes could cause legs to grow where antennas should be, or even eyes where legs should be. And the same genes that build their legs can be swapped with ours to build human legs in us. The hox cluster is generally collinear in a matching order of expression along the anterior-posterior axis. During development, they regionalize that axis into segments. As an extreme example, look at the clearly divided triple-segmented bodies of insects. The earliest and most conserved of these segments among bilaterians is cephalization. That's the concentration of sensory and feeding structures in a recognizable head that can be distinguished from the remainder of the body. Now think about how rare that is, given everything we've seen in the series so far. Yet whenever we think about encountering extraterrestrial life with a completely novel origin, unrelated to our own, we usually assume they'd somehow still be bilaterally symmetrical animals with heads, as if that's the only way to be. It's not even on this planet. And having a head isn't always conserved, either. Look at echinoderms. They started out as bilaterally symmetrical larvae, but then revert to radial symmetry with no front or back, left or right. 
It's like they devolved that way. Their most advanced feature might be a single light-sensitive photoreceptor at the end of each of their... I won't call these legs. The starfish don't have five legs. They actually have thousands of legs. It's just that they're all really tiny and hidden beneath their tentacle extremities. The clade bilateria could also be called triploblasta, as distinguished from the diploblast radiata. And this is a bigger deal than anything we've talked about so far, because it's a developmental change, one that has a huge advance. Being triploblast refers to embryology. It means we develop from a zygote into a spherical cluster of cells that becomes hollow with a fluid-filled cavity inside. The interior lining of this cavity is the endoderm, which usually becomes the lining of epithelial cells just like in proto-animals like placozoans. Diploblasts develop a second, deeper germ layer called the ectoderm, which becomes their nervous system. In more advanced animals, the ectoderm would also tie that network together with a brain. Triploblasts develop a third, clearly defined germ layer between the other two. This is the mesoderm, and it differentiates into lining of body cavities, mucus, connective tissues, blood cells, muscles, and so on. The earliest bilaterians appear in the fossil record between 580 and 600 million years ago. But those are the ones with hard parts which are easier to fossilize. Biologists expect that something like an acelomorph flatworm with a planula larva was likely the link between diploblasts and triploblasts, and it's highly unlikely we would ever find a fossil of that. However, recent molecular phylogenetic research strongly suggests that acelomorph worms are likely to be the oldest living bilaterian lineages, sharing a great many of the expected characteristics in common with their hypothetical ancestral urbilaterian. So whether you will accept or reject that you might have evolved from some sort of lowly worm, would you at least admit that you're a mostly bilaterally symmetrical animal because of your multiple eukaryote cells, including opisticont cells, muscles, mucus, central nervous system, and a complete digestive tract connecting the mouth in your head to the anus in your bottom? I mean, even if you're a little lopsided, you still fit all the criteria, right?